Welcome to the Peter King Podcast, presented by Salesforce. I'm Peter King. I'm going to be joined by Miles Simmons, my friend from NBC Sports. And this is going to be an NFL at midseason podcast. As you listen to this and prepare for week nine in the National Football League, you will be at the point where you will see game number 136 in the regular season. That will be exactly halfway through the 272-game NFL season. And so Miles and I are going to go through the first half of the season and look forward to the second half of the season. In the middle of our podcast, we'll be joined by Jeff Perlman, He's the author of The Last Folk Hero, The Life and Myth of Bo Jackson. So, welcome to this week's pod, Miles. I'm going to ask you a very open-ended question on the Peter King podcast presented by Salesforce. Give me one takeaway from week eight that really sort of slapped you in the face. You give me yours, I'll give you mine. And then we're going to get into a little bit of projecting the races down the stretch. Okay. Uh, I'll say this. When a kicker has a chance to win the game, the kicker's got to make the kick. If it's a makeable kick, that thing's got to sail through the uprights. And I know that DJ Moore probably should not have taken off his helmet because he got penalized and that puts the thing 15 yards back for Eddie Pinheiro. However, 48 yards is a makeable kick in the 2022 NFL, right? I I think at a certain point, you expect your kicker to hit from 48. He's got to do it. And certainly if you're kicking from 32 in overtime, you got to hit that kick, man. There's it's unacceptable to not hit the kick. So as Steve Wilkes said on Monday that they're not going to bring in any other kickers. So good for him for keeping his job, I guess, but man, I, I, I know the DJ Moore shouldn't have taken off the helmet, but kicker, pick up your teammate, man. Kickers got to make their kicks. You know, the amazing thing about that particular instance is if Eddie Pinero makes that kick, whatever the distance is, if he makes the extra point, or even if he makes the short field goal in overtime, Mm -hmm. The Carolina Panthers today are alone in first place in the NFC South. Instead, the Carolina Panthers are alone in last place in the NFC South. And I know you're going to say, well, wait a second, Peter. All Carolina would have been would be be tied with every other team at three and five atop the NFC South if he makes the kick. Hold Mm -hmm. on a minute. Yes, they all would have been three and five. But the Carolina Panthers would be 3-0 and in the NFC South, and they would have the tiebreaker advantage going into the second half of the season. So that was a big miss. It was two big misses by Eddie yeah. Pinheiro. I'm going to give you my big takeaway uh, from Week 8, and that is <clears throat> I think the San Francisco 49ers showed that they are going to be in the final four of the Super Bowl tournament come late January. And I don't just say that only because they kind of skunked the Rams. I say it because they're really a complete team. They're a complete team with like a Bob Greasy type quarterback. And for those of a certain age, I think we all understand that a Bob Greasy type of quarterback, the proverbial complimentary player, take what the defense gives you. Don't try to win the game on your own, which is about what I think we all think of Jimmy Garoppolo right now. I think the 49ers stamped themselves in that game at SoFi Stadium by beating the Rams for the third time in the regular season, in this calendar year, third time in 44 weeks, I think what it says to me, especially how they play now and the fact that they have really good weapons on offense and were really good without Debo Samuel, who will be back. 
probably after the bye, but if not soon after. So I don't know, Miles. I think the 49ers are pretty good, and I think they're going to be playing football deep into January. I would agree with you. I think, though, that the 49ers are never quite as good as they look against the Rams in the regular season because, <laughs> look, Kyle Shanahan is now 9-3 and three over Sean McVay, and, you know, he's got a record below 500 against everybody else. So I, it, it's one thing for them to do it against the Rams. They always do it against the Rams. At least they have since 2019, right? I mean, that's it's been that long going. You have to go back to the 2018 season to see when the Rams beat the 49ers for the last time. And that was in the last two weeks of the regular season. So now, yeah, it, it's basically been the same thing for years and years and years now. I want to see them do it against other teams. Not that I don't think that they will, but I think that there's a December 15th matchup between the 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks. And when those two teams get together, it's a big old clash. And that thing is going to be on Thursday night football. So that's what I'm really looking forward to when it comes to the NFC West and seeing who's going to finish atop that division, because that game is going to tell us a lot. And it's not for a very, very long time. So we don't really have to talk about that for a long time. But yeah, I, I, I also do think that the 49ers are quite good, though. Yeah, I would just say that the 49ers strike me. And look, I love Seattle. We're going to get into division, going division by division in a minute. But the 49ers strike me as one of those teams that they don't care where the game is. I don't think home field sure. advantage has ever been that big a deal to the 49ers. But anyway, we'll see. I do agree. I The Seattle Seahawks absolutely, totally fascinate me. Um, but I'm going to go a little bit in order, division by division, as we go through this. Let's do it. And let's start geographically where you are, Miles Simmons. Oh, let's start with that NFC West. And we will go uh, NFC West, NFC North, NFC South, and we'll finish with the NFC East, and we'll do the same thing with the AFC. So now that we have brought up the 49ers and the Seahawks, look into your crystal ball right now and tell me who's standing on January 8th or 9th or whatever after week 18, who wins this division and why? I think it's going to be the Seattle Seahawks. And I think that because I like the way they play and I think that they are going to be able to separate themselves a little bit throughout the course of maybe the next few weeks when it comes to wins and losses. And because of that, even when they play the 49ers in December, uh, the 49ers, they have to get healthy, right? And right now their defense is not, is not really where it's been early on in the season, in part because of injuries. They've got to get Eric Armstead back. All right, once they get Debo Samuel back, they're going to yeah. be great offensively as, as they have been. But there are guys that they need to get back first. And until then, I think Seattle can keep stacking a little bit with what we've seen. And frankly, I just love the edge that they're playing with, with Geno Smith at quarterback, with Pete Carroll, who is as old as anybody in the NFL when it comes to coaching, and he looks as energized as he's ever been out there. I mean, he's running down the sideline getting a penalty because he's so excited that Geno Smith is running for potentially a game-clinching first down. So I, I just love the way that they play. And for me right now, I think that they're going to win that division. I really like the Seahawks, too. In fact... Uh, right now, I would say, I think the Seahawks are going to be the sixth seed in the NFC. Okay. I think the 49ers are going to win this division. In part, right now, you know, the 49ers have done what they should do in this division so far. Uh, the 49ers are 3-0 and in division games right now. Seattle is 1-1. One and one. And, you know, I think that is a prominent part of this. But I think the other part of this is that down the stretch of this season, I don't think <clears throat> the two schedules are really diametrically different, but I will say that all the games that each team has left 
uh, the Seahawks have the toughest individual game because they are at Kansas City in week 16. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so if you look at Seattle versus San Francisco, Seattle's got a one-game edge right now, but not an edge in the... Uh, uh, not an edge in the, uh, uh, you know, basically division record in the tiebreaker. So I like San Francisco a little bit better. And I think San Francisco's defensive depth, I think, is really going to show up down the stretch. My big question to you is, you Ram watcher, you, <laughs> are the Los Angeles Rams going to make the playoffs? Uh, not according to what I have on my sheet in front of me. No, they are not. And I don't think that they've got the horses this year, particularly on the offensive line. And, you know, they've tried to figure some things out. They did figure some things out offensively in that game that they played uh, this last Sunday against San Francisco, at least in the first half. But I I just, I don't see it from them this year. And I, I think that they could still finish nine and eight. You know, I, I think 10 and seven isn't out of the realm of possibility, but strangely sort of in the NFC, I don't think that that's going to be good enough for them to actually get in, in part because of the strong starts that we've seen from these teams that are elsewhere, right? Look at the NFC East right now. There are, uh, there are no teams under 500 there. That's a huge advantage. You know, I mean, and I just... I don't know. I, I just, even though I think the Rams are still going to be okay, I don't know that they're going to be good enough to actually make it into one of those seven spots. You know, I really agree with you, Miles. I don't foresee them making the playoffs either. thing that worries me a little bit looking at the Niners long term is the wear and tear on Cooper Cup. So uh, Cooper Cup right now, he's since the, in the last 14 months, um, he's played 28 football games, uh, including the four playoffs. And obviously now there's a 17 game season. You right. saw that at the end of Sunday's game, they're down 17. He gets hurt on a play that, you know, when you're down three scores and you're after the two minute warning, it's a little weird to be, uh, you know, really for whatever reason, uh, still, and I don't mean you ought to just kneel on the, on the ball, but I, I didn't, I didn't like the timing of trying to still force more balls to a guy who you're going to need if you have any chance at all. And, right. and miles, if, if, you know, I, I forget, I think he had maybe 50 targets in the four playoff games, 55 targets. This is a guy who since the beginning of last season, you know, 14 months has been targeted over 300 times. Mm -hmm. And so that means potentially 300 hits. I just would worry about that. I that that's probably not for this podcast, but I mean, it really isn't for this podcast, but I really think that the Rams have to have a little bit of a plan for a 29 year old receiver who's already caught 497 balls uh, and they want him to be a 34 year old receiver who still is catching 115 a year. So mm-hmm. I think they've got to mentally say to themselves, Hey, let's ratchet back what we're doing with Cooper cup and let's not have him be targeted 17 times every Sunday. Just yeah. a thought on my, no doubt. on my end. Um, Let's let's look at the NFC South, which is uh, my my Dan Campbellism of the day. A true alpha knows when it's time to concede. And that's what the Rams should have done with Cooper Cup and not throwing that ball to him on third down in that situation. Yeah, very true. Um, Let's go to the NFC South. As of now, obviously, you've got the Falcons in first place by a game. Uh, You have... Uh, Tampa Bay and New Orleans kind of floundering three and five, although New Orleans, uh, I thought, played its best game of the year on both sides yes. of the ball against Vegas in a 24 nothing victory. And then obviously you've got Carolina. And Miles, I don't discount with Carolina the fact that those players really, really want Steve Wilkes to get the job. And they want, they want to help him. They want to help him get this job or yes. a job. Because I think everybody feels like he got jobbed 
only having one year at Arizona. But I'll ask you, do you really like anybody in this division? Uh, not really, but the problem is Tom Brady's still there. And even though Tom Brady does not look like Tom Brady right now, I still have a tough time turning my brain off to say, yeah, well, he's not going to do it. He's not going to get it done this year. He's done. I really, right. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't think so. And so that's why for me right now, I have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers winning the NFC South. And I don't even know how much I, I believe it. If that quarterback was anybody but named Thomas Edward Brady, I would not be picking them to win the NFC South. But I just, I can't, I can't let it go quite yet. Until I know it's over, I'm not saying it's over. Well, I'll tell you the reason I like the Saints, and it's not just because I'm stubborn. Oh. And at the beginning of the year, I not only picked them to win the division, I picked them to have the best record in the NFC. Uh, that's not looking really promising right now. Not- I, I, I like New Orleans because if they can play even at a B-minus level on defense, I think their offense is enough to be very threatening. Last four games, they've scored 32, I'm sorry, they've scored 39, 26, 34, and 24. And obviously their defense showed up against Vegas on Sunday. And I think it's it's crazy to be predicting Andy Dalton over Tom Brady. I get it. But (laughs) yeah, there's too much there's too much wrong with Tampa. I know. There just is. And, and I, I, I want to say in Brady, we trust, I really do. But when you look at everything, Brady's not playing next to V to V on the defensive line and they're averaging, uh, they're giving up 4.8 yards a carry. Uh, He's, he's not playing the secondary and he hasn't been part of a group that you know, basically is, is averaging nearly two touchdown passes given up a game. So I think it's one thing to fix the receiver group and to maybe get him protected enough, but I just don't think this defense is what it promised to be at the beginning of the year. And it is demonstrated so far this year. You're not wrong. And that's why I, I am sort of concerned about it. I mean, this could be a seven and 10, eight and nine division winner that goes into the postseason, but it's still Tom Brady. And I don't know. I, I, I thought that the Buccaneers, when he got there in 2020, were going to be seven and nine and it would be, Oh, Tom Brady's palling around with Bruce Arians. And Oh, look, Gronk is there. And then this is, that's that. And then all of a sudden they lose to Kansas city in November and then boom, like everything changed and they figured it out. They got to the postseason. They dominated in the postseason on the road and then boom, they're in the super bowl at home and they win it. So I don't know. I just, I can't get it out of my head that if Tom Brady wins that division and then he gets to the postseason, who's to say that he doesn't just keep going full Tom Brady and make it, you know, maybe I don't know if they'll make it to the Super Bowl. I don't think they're good enough to do that, but I think that he could win a playoff game or two if they get into the tournament. And that's all it's about. Just get yourself there and who knows what happens. Especially in the NFC, because unless you're playing Philadelphia or maybe Dallas, Tell me the matchup that you just have no chance of winning right. uh, playing at home in the first round in, in that tournament. That is unless San Francisco is a wild card team, but we'll see. Um, I am a little fascinated by the Atlanta Falcons. Had a long conversation with, uh, uh, with Arthur Smith on Sunday evening. Um, it's funny. Arthur Smith such an interesting guy because he's a um he's a very well read guy and on his long drive into work at 4 50 5 a.m 5 10 on weekday mornings uh, he'll put a book on tape in there and Mm -hmm. uh or or however people you know use the verbal books and i I really, I, I always know when I end a conversation with uh, Arthur Smith, he's going to say to me, 
got any good books for me? Because I've given him <laughs> a few and he's, he's read them, you know, and, and all that. And I said, you've got to get the Bo Jackson book by Jeff Perlman. And he goes, oh yeah, Perlman's great. Love his stuff. Yeah. I said, he interviewed 720 people for this book. Wow. I said, and you know, it's the totally unvarnished Bo. And I think there are lessons in it, you know, and one of the lessons, and I bet you may share this with your team, is that Bo Jackson only played 39 football games in his life. Third, in the NFL, in the NFL. Yeah. Only played 39 games. And just think, we all talk about him as this mythic figure. And I guess part of being a mythic figure is you were there and then you were gone. And that's right. really what the case is with Bo. And I said, it's just a great example and a great illustration of, hey, you better be all in because you have no idea how long it's going to last. Anyway, that's my little Arthur Smith story for the day. So, NFC North. I mean, I guess we're both going to slam dunk Minnesota. But I think the real question is, because Minnesota is going to romp with this division. The real question is, what chance do you give Green Bay to recover enough to be a wild card? I give them a decent chance, but I don't know that they're actually going to accomplish it. I, because I think that there's no moral victories. All right, first of all, there aren't. But sometimes you do kind of figure some things out about yourself in a loss. And I think on Sunday night, the Packers figured out how they can win games against teams not named the Buffalo Bills is by running the ball, right? You have to be able to do that with A.J. Dillon, right? And, 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 you know, you have to be able to make sure you're moving the ball in that way. And so I think they can do that. I think that's the way that they're going to be able to get play action working and then start to establish that trust with the receivers for Aaron Rodgers. So I think they can finish nine and eight, you know, maybe 10 and seven, get above 500. Is that going to be enough to beat the Giants? I, I don't know. I, I kind of don't think so. The Green Bay Packers, and you hit it exactly where I'm going to hit it. I think that it's going to be really, really tough for them. But I think also that when you have uh, Jones and Dylan as a one-two punch, you know, and these guys are averaging between them 4.9 yards a carry. And basically what they've done so far in running for 930 yards in eight games how many more times do you have to get beat over the head to say, until you get the passing game going, it's okay to try to win 17 to 13. It's right. okay because that might be what your team is right now. If I were Matt LaFleur, I might be started going when the, there was a year that the Steelers, the last time a, a team had a 60% run at the end of the year, it was the Steelers like 18 years ago. And it was Jerome Bettis. And 15 years ago, whatever it was. But I'll never forget, you know, the Steelers that year were basically, their whole credo was, hey, listen, we're not going to force a square peg into a round hole. If we run the mm -hmm. ball the best, that's what we're going to do. So yep. I agree with you. I think they ought to look at the run. I think it's going to be hard for Green Bay. And the only way they can do it is by kind of retooling mentally what they do on offense. Okay, let's go to the NFC East. Now, I think Philadelphia is not just good and hasn't been challenged. I think Philadelphia is really, really good. And I think they're going to win this division. But I also think both the Giants and Dallas are going to win wild cards. Give me your view of the most top-heavy division in football right now. I think it's probably about the same. Look, I, I think that the Eagles right now are kind of a wagon and you look at the way they beat the Pittsburgh Steelers, where you get 
uh, A.J. Brown going down the sideline and catching three touchdowns as he did. And then he almost got another one and he was caught from behind. I mean, he was playing pretty much out of his mind. And they are so versatile, right? They've shown that they can do that offensively, but then they can still bludgeon you with the run offensively too. They get Robert Quinn. I love that addition for them as a fresh edge rusher that you can continue to rotate in. And that's the guy, he had what, 18 and a half sacks last year. That's crazy. I mean, he had 19 sacks or 19 and a half sacks, whatever it was for the St. Louis Rams back in 2013. So he's still a veteran that can get it done. So I love the way they're playing and I love how much fun they're having. I love that Jalen Hurts told Mike Florio that the team is kind of starting to take on his personality as a quarterback and how everything you have to keep pushing forward and doing things like that. I think the Eagles are going to not just win that division, but be the number one seed in the NFC. But then behind them, Dallas, I think, probably finishes second. And then you got the New York Giants at third. And I say that because I love Dallas's defense. I love the way they get after the QB. And I trust the quarterback, Dak Prescott, and the run game with Pollard and, and Zeke more than I trust what's going on with the New York Giants, A, because of talent, and B, because of experience. You know, look, it's it's that's a very understandable way to think. Uh, the Cowboys on the surface look like a better team uh, and for the most part in the first half of the season have been a better team. They own the head-to-head victory. One thing about the Giants is they are a tricky, tricky team and a hard team to read. Um, and the reason why I think they're a hard team to read is that I don't really get game to game. I always think to myself, how are they going to be good enough on offense? I thought Seattle yeah. played them really smart. They said, they said, Saquon Barkley, you are not going to beat us. Go ahead, Daniel right. Jones. You know, but we are going to crowd the box and Saquon Barkley, you're not going to beat us. So yeah. I, show me something. What Daniel I'll do, Jones. Miles, is yeah, of course. He's and that's the second half of this season. And I think Daniel Jones has been much better than any any of us would have thought he'd be. In fact, I agree. I would say right now, if I were the Giants, I'd lean toward keeping him. Look, I yes. think, hey, the 2021 draft, a cautionary tale about mm-hmm. quarterbacks. And didn't everybody in 2021 mm-hmm. think Trevor Lawrence was the man? Anybody mm-hmm. would give anything for him. <clears throat> we're a year and a half into Trevor Lawrenceville uh, down in Duval. I'd be a little concerned about whether they have bought uh, a BMW or whether they bought an Edsel. And I, I don't know. I definitely would not be giving up on him yet. Absolutely. But he had some bad moments in London against the Denver Broncos. There's no way Jacksonville should have lost that game. No way. And they lost it because of their quarterback. Coincidentally, the second draft pick in 2020, the second pick in the draft in 2021, Zach Wilson, he lost the game that the New York Jets should not have lost to the New England Patriots. So anyway, that's, it's just, it just, I, that's not what this podcast is about, but I'd just be a little bit worried about that. Okay, listen, we're going to get into Jeff Perlman now and we'll hit the NFC team or AFC teams rather on our way out of Perlman. But Miles, um, I'm just, I, I've asked a lot of people this in the last few days who I talked to. Like when I say Bo Jackson, what do you think of? And because look, <clears throat> You weren't a sports writer or, or, I mean, you weren't even (laughs) in the, alive at at the start of them. And I wonder, were you alive for any part of Bo Jackson? And now that you can look back on him, football, baseball, all that stuff, what's your thought about Bo Jackson? Uh, Well, let's put it this way. My sports consciousness did not begin until Bo Jackson's career had long been over. So I think when you look back at him from my perspective, from my generation, it's 
wow, this is one of the greatest athletes of all time. And it is such a shame that injuries derailed him because there's never been anybody who has come after him that has been like him, that has been as effective as he was, not just in football, but also in baseball. And the, the invention of YouTube is probably one of the greatest things ever yeah. that can have you appreciate a former athlete like this because you can go back and you can watch those clips. And frankly, that's probably where my real appreciation for Bo Jackson started coming up because you can see the throws that he used to make from right field all the way to third base. That's unfreaking believable, right? You can see the runs that he would have when he was with the Raiders. So I love the fact that Jeff Perlman wrote a book about it, and I can't wait to dig into it myself. Played 39 games in the NFL, and the last game he played basically ruined his athletic career. He got avacular necrosis, which is basically the death of one of your hips. All blood flow is cut off from that hip, and it just became... Almost, you're going to read this book, and it's almost torturous to read how Bo Jackson continually tries to, you know, reclaim his athletic greatness, and he could never get back to where he was. But anyway, let's listen to Jeff Perlman. He's got some really, really good insights and stories about uh, Bo Jackson with his new book. So happy to be joined by Jeff Perlman, a friend of mine former SI colleague, and he's the author of a new book called The Last Folk Hero, The Life and Myth of Bo Jackson. And to say I enjoyed this book would be a vast understatement. I read this book, which is 440 some pages. I read this book in 22 hours and I just could not put it down. It was utterly fantastic. Jeff, I'm so happy you could join me and just know that um, people who really appreciate good reporting will absolutely love this book. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm happy, happy to be here, obviously. So Jeff, um, this is a difficult subject not because it isn't rich with angles and rich with stories, but it's a difficult subject because Bo Jackson is kind of boorish and he's not welcoming necessarily. And I take it he gave you very little to no help with this book and which does not prevent you from doing a book, but... Tell me how Bo's personality affected this book, if at all. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, he, early on, when I decided to do the book, I wrote him a letter and I sent a couple of my other books. And he called me back one day and um, we spoke for a half hour and he was really nice, actually. He was driving, he lives outside of Chicago. He was driving to pick up his wife a salad and he was chatty. And he basically said, I don't, I don't mind you doing a book, I, I but I don't want to help you. Uh, but he was nice about it. He basically, you know, people approach me all the time and it just doesn't interest me. So I don't want to do it. And I said, that's fine. And um, I got really lucky. Reporting wise, I got really lucky. I, um, Dick Shap, the late Dick Shap, wrote Bo Jackson's autobiography in 1990. It was called Bo Knows Bo. It was really good. I read it when I was in high school and I loved it. And before Dick Shap's death, um, he donated all his notes, all his tapes from all the interviews he did with Bo Jackson for that book. So hours and hours and hours and hours of audio tapes, all transcribed, all his notes. And they're all at the Auburn Library. And for about 250 bucks, they sent it all to me. Um, so I had this treasure trove of, of Bo Jackson material sitting with Dick Schaap in restaurants and sitting with Dick Schaap in his house. And just opening up and talking about everything. And most of that was never used in Bo Knows Bo. I mean, pages and pages of material. So I felt like I really got good insight into him, even though he didn't cooperate with the book. And his personality is he's guarded. He's really guarded. And he's really kind of brooding. And he's moody. And he can be off-putting. He's also has a big heart and all that. 
but he it isn't it isn't always easy with him. That's a fact. You know, I know that probably everybody who listens to this clearly knows a lot about Bo Jackson, but because he has not stepped foot on an athletic field for 28 years, I thought we should probably take a minute to establish Bo Jackson's greatness and the myth uh, and kind of the myth-making machine that Bo Jackson was. So Bo Jackson only played 39 NFL games in his life. In his 39th game, he suffered a severe hip injury uh, in a playoff game against the Cincinnati Bengals on a tackle. Uh, and he suffered what is called a vascular necrosis, which essentially means your hip and the blood running to your hip, in essence, is going to die. And you're going to be severely limited unless you get an artificial hip from having a normal life and normal uh, being able to move normally for the rest of your life. And at the time that this happened, essentially, you know, you, you, you think about it three decades ago. And my first question, I think, Jeff, about his kind of his myth and the mythology around him is we all understand how great he was uh, thinking back. But I wonder, what do you think when you look back at him, particularly as a football player, okay? What do you think is important for us to remember about Bo Jackson now uh, more than three decades since he played his last game? I consider him without any doubt, and I've been covering, I've been a sports writer for a long time, the greatest athlete who's ever walked the earth. I truly do. I consider him the greatest athlete who's ever walked the earth. And I, you can take this, it's a big umbrella thing, but I always, this is my pitch on, on Bo Jackson. In high school, he won back-to-back -back Alabama State Decathlon championships, both times without running the final event, the 1500, because he was so far ahead on purpose because he hated doing the 1500. He ran most of the events in the decathlon while wearing his sweatpants and tennis shoes. He set five state track and field records separate from the decathlon. Um, he set the single season national record for home runs in a season by a high school player with 20 in only 25 games. He missed seven games because of track meets. The day after winning the decathlon as a senior in high school on a sprained ankle, he pitched his only game of the year for the, uh, McAdory high baseball team and struck out 13 in a playoff game in a win. He stole 90 out of 91 bases in his career at McAdory. I mean, he won the Heisman trophy. Uh, I mean, you know, he is, he, he was an unstoppable force an absolutely unstoppable force on that Monday night football run. Not everyone talks about the Bosworth run on Monday night football, but to me, the, be the beautiful run is the 91 yard run um, where Seven different in which he disappeared Seattle. up the tunnel. Disappears up the tunnel. If you watch that play closely, seven different Seahawks, including Kenny Easley, the elite safety at the time, had angles on him. He just ran past them all. I talked to one coach with the Seahawks, George Dwyer, who he was holding his notes on the sideline, and he swore to me his notes got sucked up when Bo Jackson ran by. And Dave Craig, the quarterback for the Seahawks at the time, said he literally heard Bo Jackson run by. And it didn't mean I heard him run by like I heard his feet. Like I heard a whoosh run by me. And he said, it's the only time that's ever happened in my career. He was ridiculous. So uh, I, I, there are so many interesting parts of this book, Jeff. And I've asked you to, um, to read a passage of this book for me and for uh, our listeners. And I could have picked out a hundred passages that, that really would illustrate the level of work and the level of interest uh, that I had in this book because there are just so many things in this book. I guarantee you, if you pick up this book, you'll not only learn everything about Bo Jackson, but you'll learn what reporting really is because it's hard sometimes 
when you say, I'm going to write a book about Bo Jackson, my first thought is, man, it's going to be hard because I remember Bo is a real reticent guy, probably won't help you much. And this book is such a great example. It, Jeff wasn't helped by Bo. You know, I mean, he wasn't fought by Bo, but he wasn't helped by Bo Jackson. But I have picked um, a story and a passage in this book that came on Bo Jackson's last day of his life as a professional athlete. At the time, his hip was ravaged by this football injury, and now he had determined, I'm gonna come back to baseball, and I'm gonna play baseball for multiple years, which he did do with an artificial hip. And so now at age 31, he's a California angel, and in, in this game, uh, 1994, I believe, Jeff, right? In 1994, yep. uh, baseball was on the verge of shutting down in a labor dispute, shutting down for the season. And this was an August night in Anaheim where the California Angels were playing the Kansas City Royals. The stadium was maybe 40% full. They said there were 19,000 people there. Who knows? So in this last game of the year that everyone probably knew they were in trouble with this season, the manager of the Angels, Marcel Latchman, started Bo Jackson in left field. He batted him sixth against a good pitcher, Tom Gordon of Kansas City. And Jackson came up for the first time in the second inning. So you'll hear uh, Jeff reference uh, Jackson's good buddy Rex Hudler watching from the dugout and also the general manager who took the risk of bringing in Bo Jackson for this last season in baseball Bill Bavese watching from a box upstairs Jeff take it away okay. uh, Jackson single to right and what followed is one of the most remarkable professional sports moments no one bothered to remember with Greg Myers at the plate and Mike McFarland, his old teammate, catching, Jackson took a five-step leadoff first. Then, when Gordon began his delivery, Jackson bolted. It certainly wasn't as it used to be. The sound of a thoroughbred, the power of a diesel train, the speed of Houston McTair. But Bo Jackson running hard remained a sight to behold. On the Angels' bench, Rex Hudler held his head in his palms. No, he yelled. Bo, what are you doing? Latchman was equally appalled no one had given the green light yet somehow jackson slid in a second beneath the tag of shortstop greg gagney and popped up in a cloud of dust safe some of the 19,605 in attendance politely applauded most however knew not that they had just witnessed jackson's sole steal attempt of the season the game lasted two hours and 32 minutes it concluded with a 70 percent vacated stadium a two-to-one california win and a glum understanding that the 1994 Major League season was likely over. About 20 minutes after the final pitch, Bavese was sitting in his box high above the playing surface, alone with his thoughts and a morbid sense of doom. He gazed downward through the darkness and movement caught his eye. A man wearing long underwear, no shirt, and no shoes was jogging out from the Angels dugout and across the infield. Upon reaching second base, he looked to make certain no one was watching, then bent at the waist, dropped his arms, and yanked the bag from the ground. Base tucked beneath his right elbow, the man walked back to the dugout, down the flight of steps, and vanished. But Vasey would never forget the moment. Bo Jackson wanted one last keepsake. Fantastic. I just Thanks. love that. The reason I love it is that even though Bo, in so many ways, you, you, you write about him, and it's so interesting, in so many ways... He's like a wet blanket, you know, he's, he just, he doesn't really revel in celebrating who he is. He doesn't necessarily at the time appreciate it. Late in his baseball career, he's one of the nicest guys in the world. You know, when he's on the White Sox, when he's on the Angels, he's good to his teammates and he takes them out and buys them suits and he introduces Alex, Ellis Burks to sushi. And I, I, you know, there's so many cool things 
about this that, that are so much fun, but that to me just said that Bo Jackson understood it was over and he really wanted something to remember his last game by. Yeah. Also, it's interesting because, and I hadn't thought about this, and no one's asked about that passage until you right now, so I actually love that. Um, he really wasn't a guy of keepsake. Like, like, he gets his first hit with the Memphis Chicks, minor league baseball. They save it. He says, I don't care. He gets his first major league hit off Steve Carlton, you know, a 321-game winner. Not only does he not care about the ball, he has no idea who Steve Carlton is. He doesn't he know who he is. Didn't know who he was. No idea. It's amazing. Um, he also did, not for nothing, Peter, that was his first major league hit, his first major league at bat. He was timed running a 3.6 down the first baseline, which was the second fastest home to first time for right-handed hitter in history. And that was his first at bat. But it's crazy. But he didn't care. He had no need for keepsakes. He just didn't care about him. So there's something really beautiful about him knowing at the end, here I am, I'm going to keep this bag. There's one other passage in the book that, is really almost like a non sequitur to his career uh, in so many ways, except I think it says a lot about what was important to Bo Jackson. I want you to tell me the story of Greg Arednik, a 16-year-old high school student from Indiana who was at Bo Jackson's game at Comiskey Park when, as a member of the Chicago White Sox, when everybody thought it was all over for Bo Jackson, he did something extraordinary. Tell me about Greg Redneck. It's very funny. You, uh, you, when you texted me the other day, you said you were really impressed that I found that kid, Greg. And I have to say that was one of my better finds. You know, you find certain people and you're like, oh, I got this guy. That's kind of, that's, that's pretty good. Greg was a kid at the White Sox home opener or, uh, it wasn't the home openers, but it was Bo Jackson's first home run in his comeback with the White Sox, you know, with the healthy hip. And he's there with all his family and the White Sox are getting killed. Actually, it is their home opener. They're getting destroyed and they're about to leave. And his dad turns to him and says, I don't know if we should leave. Bo Jackson's up. He's going to hit this one to you. And he hits the ball to him and um, he catches the ball and he's thrilled. And I think it was Ellis Burks, who was also with the White Sox, who fa who said, hey, kid, that was, you know, that's, that ball is going to mean something to Bo. And he goes back into the clubhouse. He does the whole thing. And uh, he gets to meet Bo Jackson. And he presents Bo with the ball. And Bo is awesome, you know, and, like, I think gave him a bat, posed for a picture, and gave him a baseball and, like, made this kid's life uh, uh, in the middle of this blowout game on this freezing cold day in, in at, you know, at Comiskey. I'm telling you, Peter, he is kind of a wet blanket, but like he just gave a lot of money to the Evaldi victims, like for to pay for funeral expenses. He runs a bike race, right. bow bikes, that raises a lot of money. He's a he's a curmudgeon with a heart, with a really good heart, I think. But tell me and tell us about when you found Greg Rednick and talked to him. It's still impacted this moment, this 10 minutes of Greg Rednick's life when he was 16. It still impacts him now, three decades later. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, he actually wrote, I forgot about this. He wrote, um, he wrote an essay in school who his hero was, and his hero was Bo Jackson. And I'm, I'm actually talking to this guy, and he's getting emotional talking about this thing that happened when he was a 16-year-old kid because he loved Bo Jackson so much. And it was just a really profound sort of little tiny moment that Bo Jackson wouldn't even remember in his life that still touches him to this day, you know? Um, yeah, I love, I'm, see, hard to, sometimes important to remember the little things you do for kids resonates far into adulthood. What did Bo Jackson do with that baseball, Jeff? Oh, shoot, now you're testing me. What did he do with the baseball? Do you want oh, me to tell you no, what he did with it? No, I know what he did. I'm sorry, I forgot. Well, he didn't wind up doing it though. He was gonna put it and because it was all right. Now you got me going. It was his first. Um, it was his first home run since he came back. His mom had recently died. He was devastated by the death of his mother, and he um he was gonna put it in 
uh, like attach it to her grave and put it above her grave in a in a bronze sort of casing. Um, I went to Bo Jackson's mother's grave and there is no ball in a, in a casing. So I guess some for some reason or another, he never actually did it. But his plan at the time was to put it in casing. Yeah, that was that just was an amazing thing, I thought. Jeff, um, how many people did you interview for this book? Uh, 720. That, do you find that amazing? H how long a period of time did it take? It was about two years. I, um, the thing is, I just, you know what, honestly, Peter, I swear to God, I always remember when we were at SI and I remember Gary Smith saying something about his, his approach to storytelling, the great writer, Gary Smith. And he was talking about always make the extra call, always make the extra call, always make the extra call. And, you know, he would write these stories that he had five months and he, they were rich in detail. And you wonder, how did he know that? How did he know the name of the dog? How did he know that he was drinking a Diet Coke, not a Pepsi? You know, how did he know all these little things? And it's because he always made the extra call. And that had a very, 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 very profound impact on me. Um, the idea of always making the extra call and always calling the next per person, the next person, finding the name of the dog, finding the, what kind of car it was, finding how old the house was, all those little things. Even reading how you had me read that passage. And I was thinking about how like all the little details that go into that final game, little things that you have to look at, what inning it was, what the count was. Who was on the mound? What, you know, what was his history with Bo? How many guys were left on the Royals from when Bo was there? Like, you know, you realize, like, looking back at the Gary Smith pieces, how hard those things were because he really was about making the extra call. And I, I'm no Gary Smith, but I'm very much about making the extra call. You know, that reminds me of something. I got an email from a reader after I wrote a... Uh a story in 2015, I think it was, a week in the life of a quarterback. It was Carson Palmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a play in the game that he that Palmer threw a pass to Larry Fitzgerald. And Fitzgerald, after the game, told me the ball went off his fingertips. And he was sure he had it. He was sure he had it. And then it was like a little gust of wind took it. It was a weird thing, but he was positive he had it. And then all of a sudden he didn't have it. So I called a meteorologist who was on the field that day because you know how sometimes at football games uh, they'll say, hey, for your, for your ride home, it's gonna be uh, cloudy and windy and rainy or whatever, you know, or, or whatever. And this guy, this meteorologist was at the game and he remembered the swirling winds on the top of the stadium that day. And he remembered, it was very, I, I mean, not that he remembered that moment, but, you know, he told me that when a ball gets up in the air at the stadium, a lot of times at that time of year, you know, a gust can take it in a, in a direction that you wouldn't necessarily have thought. And so... I, the only reason I just remember that is I got a letter after that, an email from a reader who said, holy crap, that really impressed me that you interviewed the weather guy, you know, in a story about Carson Palmer. But you're right. Sometimes those things are the most important. And I, 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 I brought it up because I wanted to ask you, of the 720 interviews, which one after you finished it, maybe because of the degree of difficulty or whatever, did you feel like, holy crap, this is a great moment in my life because this is gonna add to this book? Um, I would say it was Lionel Little Train James. Remember Lionel James? Yes. So Lionel was Bo Jackson's roommate and teammate with at Auburn. Lionel died actually a few months ago. Um, uh, which I feel like didn't get enough play. Like, to me, he was a very sort of important running back from my childhood. But Lionel James, I got him. He was very close with Bo. And what he gave me that was really great and really important was an interesting perspective about the racial dynamics at Auburn when they were there. And I don't know how much time you spent at Auburn. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. It's very white and was very, very white back then and very conservative. And 
Lionel James just told me a story. It really hit me where he said, when uh, Bo's uh, sophomore year, the the uh, resident, the athletic residence hall was under renovation. So they put all the athletes in trailers around town, like portable ho- housing units around town. And Lionel James told me that Pat Dye, the head coach, called him into his office and said, look, we know that you and Bo um, like white women, that you date white women sometimes and you, you, you are seen with white women. I'm going to put you farther away from campus than maybe I normally would because I just don't want that to be a, tr- a problem. And he said, I don't have a problem with you dating. We brought you here. You're in this environment. I don't have a problem with you dating white women, but I don't know how other people are going to feel about it. So I'm just going to have you guys live far away from campus. And I was like, number one, that's insane. Number two, it's really telling. And the other thing he told yeah. me in that same conversation, he said um, he had moments. Like there was one game against Florida. He said he broke all the fingers on one hand. He broke every finger on his hand. And after the game, he's really thinking to himself for the first time, like, do these people who cheer my name every Saturday, do they care about me at all? Or am I just a piece of meat to them? You know, like, do they care that I broke my fingers? So they don't really seem to. Or am I just a meat, yeah. a piece of meat? And some guy who you would never let your daughter date. And I just thought it was a really profound two hours on the phone with Lionel James. Hey, one of the most impactful parts of the book to me uh, is the part when Greg Pratt died, their teammate at Auburn. Uh, That passage is unbelievable about uh, the way college football was probably still is in some places, but holy cow, wait until you read that part. Um, Jeff, in our remaining couple of minutes, I, I mean, this is, a, this is a big ask because I'm asking you to put this in some perspective um, and to sort of cull down whatever, 140,000 words into a paragraph. But after you finish this book, what do you think the meaning of Bo Jackson is to American sports? Wow, that's a big question. I uh, I got to say two things about this. Number one, in many ways, my motivation for writing this book is I don't think there's enough. I don't think Bo Jackson has enough meaning at this point. I don't think enough people know about Bo Jackson. I don't think most kids, we always say it's a cliche. It's almost like people lazily say, oh, everyone knows Bo knows. Bo knows that, you know, but they don't. Most kids don't actually know that. Most kids don't know who Bo Jackson is. And I think what his legacy should be truly is a guy who was raised as one of 10 kids in abject poverty, in a house with three rooms and no running water and an outhouse, a kid who had a severe stutter, who was pushed back a grade, who was a real bully as a kid but for reasons we can now understand whose mom worked three jobs two of them as a maid and never slept who just rose to this thing and overcame every possible obstacle you could even throw at him to not just become an athlete but to become the athlete the personification of athletic greatness at a time when michael jordan walked the earth joe montana walked the earth jerry rice walked the earth that he was a personification of athletic greatness. And I will I will argue to the death that Bo Jackson is the greatest athlete who's ever walked the earth. The last question I have for you is about a recent event that happened uh, <clears throat> and you got quite a lot of attention for this. It has nothing to do with Bo Jackson. It has to do with Brett Favre. And you said in a tweet, you encourage people in essence to not buy your book about Brett Favre, Gunslinger, which was another great book. Um, Tell me why you wrote what you wrote and what the reaction has been since you wrote that. And how do you feel about Favre now? I, um, so I wrote it because I was angry and I don't, I didn't, my book obviously wasn't a like softball to Brett Favre. It, there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there. I was not going easy on Brett Favre in that book, but I just was so angry and so upset and just thought, 
Here's a good way of expressing my anger. This is about the Mississippi welfare scandal and Favre's alleged involvement in it. Correct. And this is this is where I get dark. But um, I honestly feel like we in the media, I'm not saying you, but I'm just saying we, the media, in a way, I think we should have been done with Brett Favre when he sent Jan Sturger pictures of his genitalia. And he came back with Minnesota. And we're all like, ah, the gunslinger, the old gunslinger. And he literally sent pictures to a sideline reporter for the New York Jets and really damaged that woman. I know Jen. I've interviewed Jen. Jen's a good person. And that really, that really damaged her. But we gave him a second chance because he's the gunslinger and he's a great quarterback, myself as much as anyone. And the thing, Peter, the thing I don't get, and this bothers me with a lot of athletes, you're Brett Favre. You spend 20 years in the NFL. You are around people from all walks of life. It's one of the beautiful things of professional sports, the diversity of people, of clientele, guys from here, guys from here. You played with people who were, came up at largely African-Americans, poor in really rough areas, whose families probably depended on welfare to put food on the table. Like this, these are the people in your locker room. You could look around and see people who, who that, that's their saga. And you will say, allegedly, you thought it was okay to take money. And you live, you're from the poorest state in America, the poorest state, Mississippi. You think it's okay for money to be diverted from welfare, from the welfare rolls to fund a volleyball court at Southern Miss because your daughter plays there. It is so despicable and so horrendous that I, my opinion of Brett Favre is that he's crap. I have no, no interest in him whatsoever. And it hurts because I freaking used to love Brett Favre, but I, I'm done. No interest. The amazing thing to me about that whole story, and we'll see how it all plays out, but the amazing thing is Brett Favre made $141 million as a football player. And, you know, what possibly, he doesn't, he's not, an extravagant person at all. And he doesn't really do anything. You know, a few years ago, I remember him telling me a story that, you know, his wife, Deanna, had to basically not drag him, but really urge him, force him to take real vacations. He just wanted to stay around his house and ride his bike and and all that in Southern Mississippi. But whenever things like this happen, and we'll see what all the evidence says at the end. But whenever something like this happens, I always think to myself, he made $141 million. And, you know, your daughter plays volleyball at Southern Miss. And you think, how it, wherever the money is from, that, you know, because you want a premier place for your daughter to play volleyball, that... I mean, it, you should spend your own money on things like that. To think that the money couldn't have been spent better in 9 million other ways in the state of Mississippi, the poorest state on the planet. That's the thing that really gets to me. Wait, I, 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 to add on to that, I agree with everything you said. The governor at the time was Phil Bryan. Um, I never understand, like you and I, we've been very fortunate to be able to write about sports for our careers. Like it's a great job. I know we both love it. We're passionate about it. It's wonderful. You're Phil Bryant, the governor of Mississippi, and you're so enamored that a guy can throw a football far and that he won a Super Bowl that you're willing to do this, to take money from the denizens of your own state and give it to this guy because you're so in love with the fact that he was a quarterback. And I just keep that. Are you 13 years old? Like, are you, is that really who you are? Like that, having a sports star in your proximity is so important to you. It's like, could you be a bigger loser? I just, I can't even get past that, you know? There were it's so many people in public life in Mississippi were fanboys and fangirls for Brett Favre. All right, Jeff, okay. what's your next book? I don't know yet. I actually don't know yet. But when I do know, I would, I'll make sure I'll call you. Maybe the Peter King story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all I can say is, um, you know, I don't read as much as I should. And the fact is, a few days ago, I wrote to you in advance of this and said, give me a couple of passages to read. 
because it's football season and I wasn't, I wasn't going to read this complete book, but you sent me a couple of passages. We totally ignored his indoctrination into the Raiders, which is so great. We ignored Matt Millen, you know, basically, you know, trying to really stick it to him early on. We ignored Steve Young uh, being told by Hugh Culverhouse, hey, convince this guy to come here. And Steve Young basically laughing about it when, when, uh, when he said, I, I, I'm not coming. But so you told me this and I intended only to do that, but I just couldn't stop. I couldn't no. stop. And I read the book in 22 hours. It's a long book. And I guarantee you, I, I pretty much guarantee you, whoever listens to this, you won't read it in 22 hours. I'm just saying that I totally could not put this book down. Jeff, I appreciate you joining me. You got a great book. You are just, you know, you're so great at your job. You really are. You are great at your job. I have a lot of admiration for you in this. I, you, you have not done better work than this. Oh man, Peter, thank, I really appreciate that. Obviously I'm a big admirer of yours for many, many years and it's really kind of you. So thank you so much, seriously. My thanks to Jeff Perlman, some really, really interesting stuff in that discussion. And uh, look, I, I have no uh, financial interest in this. I only have literary interest and that book is absolutely tremendous. I think you're gonna like it if you get it. Okay. Let's break down the AFC now, Miles. And we're going to start actually in the AFC North because of the news of this week. And again, we are recording this before the end of the trading deadline. But obviously a big trade has happened in uh, the Chicago Bears dealing disgruntled, financially disgruntled linebacker Roquan Smith to the Baltimore Ravens for second and fifth round picks in the 2023 NFL draft. And look, the Ravens don't like to trade huge draft choices for players because they're very, very good picking players in the draft. Mm -hmm. But this really sounded like it was headed in a direction of a trade if the Bears could get decent value for them because I was skeptical that a new general manager, Ryan Poles, was going to be able to sign Roquan Smith long-term because of his inflated view of what he wants. And I don't know uh, whether the Ravens intend to aggressively try to sign Roquan Smith or not. But obviously, when we talk about the pennant race in the AFC, um, you're going to have to get better to catch the Buffalo Bills. And my first thought about this is, and I'm picking Baltimore to win the NFC North over Cincinnati. But my first thought is that this is a move not just, you know, to try to win your division. This is also a move to say, listen, if we want to have any chance this year, you know, to get out of the AFC, we got to get a little bit better defensively. Your thoughts? Yes, I, I, I definitely think so. And, you know, when I think about Roquan Smith, I mean, that dude belongs in the AFC North, whether it's for Pittsburgh or Baltimore, just one of those teams that has those dudes that are just great sideline to sideline linebackers. I, that's just, I think about him playing at Georgia and you know how he was there. And I just remember thinking when I would watch him in college, like, man, that guy looks like a pro linebacker in one of those schemes that prioritizes defense. And so it made sense for him to go to the bears, at least at that time where, you know, you think about the bears is a defensive team. I mean, when was the last time, if ever, we thought about the bears as an offensive juggernaut? I don't know that we've ever done that. So it made sense for me that he goes someplace like that. But now that he's going to go to Baltimore, that also just makes sense. You know, with one of these rugged linebackers, somebody that can come up and make plays. And if you look at the Pittsburgh, or excuse me, if you look at the Baltimore Ravens, they absolutely need to get better defensively, right? And so if you're going to be able to compete with the Buffaloes of the world, the Kansas cities of the world, teams that 
not just have, you know, really good offensive weapons where, you know, you're talking about a Travis Kelsey at, at tight end, talking about a Mark Andrews, potentially an Isaiah likely continuing to get better. You need that guy to also be able to take out the mobile quarterback too, if he starts running, you know? And so I think that kind of ability for him to go sideline to sideline, to be a thumper, that's something that Baltimore needs. And it is definitely going to improve that defense. You know, the Ravens kind of an uncharacteristic uh, 24th in the NFL in yards allowed that yes. can't sit well with, uh, uh, John Harbaugh, Eric DaCosta. So I think this is a very understandable move. Um, I think in general now, Miles, I, and I wrote in my column this week that, and, and again, by the time people listen to this, you'll know how active the trading deadline wa it right. really was. But I think that um, it's not going to be huge headlines coming down the stretch of this because even though I think teams aren't afraid of trading anymore, I do think that, uh, that a lot of teams, especially, you know, I've heard that Denver is really asking a lot for Bradley Chubb. Now I think there's a good chance Bradley Chubb goes and I'm sorry, again, we're taping this before. So, uh, you'll know by the time you listen to this most likely, but, I think that teams are being unreasonably, and of course, we, it's your right. You can ask whatever you want for a player. But if you really want to move somebody, you got to get realistic. So mm -hmm. the Ravens got realistic. They traded a lot for Roquan Smith. But I think the way the Ravens feel, if I could read Eric DaCosta, hey, look, we're going to have the 53rd pick in the second round somewhere around there. We're going to win this division. And we're going to have a lower pick. So, I mean, this is a guy who could make a huge difference. And we must think that we've got a decent chance of signing. Let's go to Cincinnati now. I want you to tell me, are the Bengals going to make the playoffs? And if so, how dangerous can they be? I think they will make the playoffs. I think it's obviously a shame that they're not going to have Jamar Chase for a few weeks um, with that hip injury. But I still have a lot of faith in Joe Burrow. And, you know, it's one of those things where they have started to figure some things out offensively. And yes, a lot of that was predicated on Jamar Chase and how good he's been the last couple of weeks. But don't discount T. Higgins, right? Don't discount Tyler Boyd. Don't, despi don't discount right. what... Uh, um, Hayden Hurst can do within that offense. Don't discount Joe Mixon either. Now, and Joe Burrow has turned himself into one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League. So I actually think that the Cincinnati Bengals are going to win the AFC North at, because, I mean, and I guess I wrote this, this down on my sheet before I knew that the, uh, the Ravens were going to trade for Roquan Smith, but I think it still holds. The, the Ravens have got some stuff to figure out defensively. I think the Bengals are already at the point where they are figuring their stuff out. And especially when Jamar Chase comes back, you know, toward the back half of the season, they're going to be able to make a real nice push into uh, late December and early January. Let's look at the AFC South. And I think it, it's very easy every year to just sort of poo poo the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> and then year after year after year, they bludgeon the living crap out of you. They sure and do. that to me, that to me is, you know, Mike Vrabel. And again, I don't mean to oversimplify this. Mike Vrabel really understands football. And... Well, no, duh. He's a head coach in the what? NFL. But what I mean is that he <laughs> no, understands the essence of football and what really, really works. Tennessee's going to win this division, and I think they're going to break their lousy playoff schneid this year. I agree with you, Peter. Look, this is a team that did not have its starting quarterback. So, I mean, like you say, right? What do you do? You make football simple. Oh, we have Derrick Henry. Let's run him. <laughs> okay, let's do it. They ended up with three 
100 plus rushing yards against the Houston Texans. Malik Will is making his first start. He threw the ball 10 times. And he said after the game, well, why wouldn't we just continue to hand the ball off to Derrick Henry and to Hilliard if they're doing what they're doing? I, it's a really good question. And that's exactly why you do it. I love the way Mike Vrabel has that team make absolutely no excuses to not have success. They didn't have Derrick Henry for most of the season last year, and they were still the number one seed in the AFC. I, I did not think that that was going to still be the case this year where they could run away with the AFC South. A few weeks ago on this podcast, I said the Jaguars were going to do it. Oops. They make me look like an idiot, especially Trevor Lawrence. My goodness, man. Like you said earlier in the show, Peter, there are some real bad decisions that were going on there in London. So I love the way Mike Vrabel has that team playing. And I agree. They're, they're going to win that division. Yeah. And to me, this is a one playoff team division. Yes. Um, I don't know why. Call me crazy, but I don't see Sam Ellinger get the, getting the Indianapolis Colts seven more wins. Ah, just a, just a, just a hunch. Uh, Not if Jonathan Taylor keeps fumbling like that too. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 bizarre. That's some bizarre stuff. Okay, let's go to the AFC West. This is a fascinating division to me because I may be the only NFL coverer in America who hasn't given up yet on the Chargers. Uh, Because, look, I don't think Denver is making the playoffs. I don't think Vegas is making the playoffs, and I am right on the edge of the table about uh, uh, about the Los Angeles Chargers. First of all, you got to have three wild cards. You do. I don't see one coming from the South. It's not coming from Cleveland or Pittsburgh. It's not coming from Denver or Vegas. Uh and and uh, you know unless you think that all three wild cards are coming from the, the the east or or it's either the Bengals and the Ravens and then two from the east, I I still think that the Chargers are going to be heard from if they can just get those receivers to get healthy and to play in tandem. Everybody said, man, Justin Herbert is a little step back. A little step back because he doesn't have anybody to throw the ball to, relatively speaking, on a consistent basis. But I, I would assume you like Kansas City in this division, but break down the West for me. Yeah, I do like Kansas City in the division. I think that even though Mike Williams and uh, Keenan Allen haven't been playing together, and now Mike Williams is dealing with an injury. I, I don't know. The, I think we brought this up last week, two weeks ago. The concerning stat for me is the yards per attempt from Justin Herbert. And I know he's been a dealing with hurt ribs. I haven't been on the injury report really for it. He's been out there. Um, but also, you know, when you don't have your uh, full um, co- uh, your full group of wide receivers, it, it can make things different. But he's averaging 4.9 yards per attempt over his last two games. And that to me is concerning because he's got some of the best arm talent in the league. And then you're not getting the ball down the field, but maybe more concerning than that is the defense for the Los Angeles chargers. And this is supposed to be Brandon Staley's calling card, but they can't stop the run again. That that's a problem. They signed Sebastian Joseph day to help do that. They traded for Khalil Mack to help do that. Now, Joey Bosa has been hurt. I I, I know, but at the same time, you, you have to be better in those situations. So I don't, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, you know, uh, is off the Chargers bandwagon. So I think it's going to be two teams from the AFC East. I don't, I don't know that the Chargers are going to be able to make it, but it could be by default because like you said, there have to be seven teams. So it's going to be one of these teams from the AFC East, I guess, or you're going to have the Chargers kind of by default. We won't bore people and discuss whether the Buffalo Bills can win the uh, AFC East. The <laughs> yes, Buffalo there we Bills go. will Next win topic. the AFC East. <laughs> right. Now we have to discuss who else is going to make it out of this division. And I'll, I'll go out on this limb. I think there's only going to be one other playoff team in the AFC East, and I think that's going to be Miami. Now, okay. <clears throat> Obviously, the New York Jets, as we sit here right now, are five and three. 
and they have played beyond anybody's level of expectation. But my, I got two problems with the New York Jets. Number one, the quarterback. Um, it's been a long time since I've heard a play-by-play guy on television say, in essence, that the quarterback is playing scared. And mm. that's essentially what Ian Eagle said on the CBS telecast. He didn't use those words. Um, as a matter of fact, let's get his exact words because his exact words are not that bad, but they surprised me with exactly what it is that he said. So Ian Eagle in the middle of <clears throat> Zach Wilson throwing three interceptions uh, in this game basically just came out uh, in the mid, I think right after the third interception. And he said, and I quote, there's been a sense of panic at the quarterback mm. position today for New York. And that's sure what it looked like to me. But it isn't only that, Miles. A lot of times, and you know, when I was sort of thinking about who I liked, who I didn't like, you look at the New York Jets schedule down the stretch of this season, okay? And not only do they play Buffalo twice, you know, down the stretch in the last nine games, mm -hmm. but listen to the road schedule of the New York Jets down the stretch. At New England, at Minnesota, at Buffalo, at Seattle, at Miami. That's I mean... Up. That's five games. Easily, easily, the Jets could go 0-5 in those games. Easily. Now, they might win one. They might win two. But that is a brutal road schedule, especially when you're probably playing for your playoff lives in week 17 and 18, and you're going to Seattle and Miami. That's an interesting little two-game road trip. They're only 3,100 miles apart. But but be that as it may, it's it's I, I I would say right now I like Buffalo and I like Miami to make the playoffs out of that division. Okay, I like Buffalo, obviously. I, I like Miami as well. I like the way that Mike McDaniel has those dudes playing and Tyreek Hill may very well set uh, the new yardage record. Um, for re receiving yards in this season. And I like the Patriots as the seventh seed and it's another one that's kind of well somebody's got to do it right i, I don't even know if the patriots are going to finish yeah. over 500 i i assume that they will because it's kind of the same leeway i was giving tom brady earlier in the show i'm, I'm gonna give it to bill belichick at, at this point but you know zach wilson cost the jets the game and Mike White was elevated, promoted, whatever you want to call it, to be the backup quarterback in that game over Joe Flacco. I don't know if that means that eventually, if Zach Wilson continues to look like he does, that we might see Mike White in there. But the thing I liked when I saw Mike White play last year was he was playing within himself and within the offense. And if you do that, and that offensive scheme is really good for Mike LaFleur coming from that Shanahan tree, Matt LaFleur's his brother, la, la, la. If, if you do that and play within the scheme, it can work for you. And sometimes Zach Wilson's not doing that. You know, he's talking about, oh, I get frustrated when I get out of the pocket and, you know, I'm, out the, I'm outside and I, I can see downfield and I want to make a play. And it gets frustrating to throw the ball away. Like, dude, that's football, man. Like, you, you have to be able to throw the ball away, live to see another down. Don't just throw it off your back foot and, you know, hope and pray it goes over to the sideline. And then, oh, look, a Patriots player now has it. You can't do those kinds of things and then expect to play winning football. So I don't see the Jets making it from that division because in part of the quarterback play. But I do see it from the Patriots as a seven seed and Miami on my sheet here I have as a six seed. You know, the New York Jets play Buffalo this week. And then they have their bye. And as you heard the angry fans about Zach Wilson at the Meadowlands on Sunday against the Patriots, if he has another performance like that, I think Robert Sala owes it to his team to play Mike White. Um, you know, you're a contending team. 
you've sort of yeah. won a little bit in spite of your quarterback to this point. Zach Wilson has not been a gigantic force uh, in this team, but I I just think that that's, a, that's an interesting team to watch. Robert Sala had Zach Wilson's back after the game. We yep. all have to play better, blah, blah, blah. You know what's happening inside that team right now. They are really wondering about Zach Wilson. And I don't think the hook is going to be very far away if he has another game like that, nor should it be, because yeah. it doesn't matter what your long-term plan is for a quarterback, where you drafted him or anything like that. You're five and three, man. You're going to lose to Buffalo. Okay, you'll be five and four going into the bye. You still have a great shot at making the playoffs and really taking the next step as a franchise. You can't do it if your quarterback's turning it over three or four times a game. Okay, last thing. I am going to give you my Super Bowl prediction. Okay. Then you're going to give me yours. And then 3,000 miles from each other, you and I are going to brawl about it. But first thing I'm going to say is I hate, I always hate picking chalk. And I thought about this a lot. I walked my dog this morning and, and I, I, I was thinking about it a lot. And I said, can I logically not pick Buffalo, Philadelphia? Is there any way that I can say, okay, Dallas is going to sneak in, maybe Minnesota, whatever. Maybe Philadelphia goes into a little bit of a, of a slump and loses the top seed. I don't know. Look, I've watched Philadelphia enough this year to know that they can win with a power running game. As you said earlier, they can win by opening it up and throwing the ball downfield. Three touchdown passes of over 25 yards uh, on Sunday uh, by Jalen Hurts to A.J. Brown. Okay, And then they're not the best defense in the league, but they are a damn good defense. And they've also added reinforcements. So to me, I really like them. And I, the only way I think Buffalo loses, honestly, uh, I, 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 the only way they lose is if they get a bunch of injuries, I think. So I think it's going to be Buffalo, Philadelphia in the Super Bowl in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, Miles, your thought. Okay. I agree with you with everything you just said about Philadelphia. I, I, but my interesting thing about this, I guess I wrote it down as I'm going through it. I think Philadelphia is going to be Tampa Bay in the NFC championship game. Now, does that sound a little crazy? Yes. But you know, like I said earlier, Tom Brady, you never know. As long as they get in the tournament, I think that they can probably compete with anybody, but they got to get to the tournament first. And at least at this point, that's no guarantee. Uh, but in the AFC, I'm going to say Kansas city is going to come out of uh, that conference. Uh, and I think it's because they understand how to use their weapons. They understand how to build th on things and win in the playoffs and Andy Reid going up against Sean McDermott for another time in the postseason. All right. Uh, this is another one of these classic battles that we keep seeing between these two teams. Kansas City tends to win the postseason games. Buffalo tends to win in the regular season. I think that that trend is going to continue. Do I really have a great reason for it? Not necessarily. I mean, but sometimes you see Buffalo and they go up. And this kind of happened on Sunday night against the Packers. And it's almost like they get a little bored. Now, Josh Allen has these weird lapses where sometimes it goes from the guy that we know is a real true MVP candidate to the 2018 Josh Allen, where he sometimes looks like a chicken with his head cut off and he's just throwing the ball randomly down the field. And sometimes it gets picked off. Sometimes it skips in there. Sometimes it's airmailed. That's the thing that concerns me about Buffalo. But I think that they will get to the AFC championship game. But even if it is in Buffalo, I just, I don't know. I think this is a year for Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, I would, I won't be surprised. I won't be surprised. I just think with the tiebreaker edge and they're one game ahead of them <clears throat> already. So basically they're two games ahead of them. Uh, in other words, for people who don't understand that weird signaling, yeah. 
The <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs are going to have to, in the last 10 weeks of this season, they're going to have to be two games better than the Buffalo Bills in order to host a potential AFC title game. That's hard to do. That's yes. really hard to do when you look at these two game teams together. But, okay, so Miles has, um, Miles has Kansas City, Philadelphia, I take it. Andy Reid Bowl, baby. Yep. The Andy Reid Bowl. And I've got uh, Buffalo and Philadelphia. And, you know, to me, I think I could, I could buy either one of those. You know, my biggest threat to that matchup right there is the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. And they have the ability, in my opinion, to get really, really hot down the stretch and to be the bowling ball at, on the 7-10 split of this NFL pennant race down the stretch. I just, I've got a thing. I just think they're going to be pretty good down the stretch. All right, Miles, thanks so much for breaking down the season. Totally, absolutely worthless predictions that no yep. one is going <laughs> to hold us to. And that Perfect. if anybody says, hey, wait a minute, you picked... You pick Buffalo and uh, Philadelphia to get in the Super Bowl. Oh, my God. Are you crazy? It was Cincinnati and Atlanta. And I said, what are you talking about? I picked Cincinnati and Atlanta a long time ago. Anyway, my thanks to Miles Simmons for helping me break this down. My thanks to Jeff Perlman. And we'll be back with another Peter King podcast next week in which we will have more fun like we have every week.